Good evening. Good evening. We are looking at this series on Beatitudes. Jesus' work, the reason that Jesus came. The world that God created was in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3. A world without sin, a world without death, a world without sickness, a world without worry, a world that is full of joy and peace. But the whole thing went off. And it is human quest always that we should have a world. We work towards everything. The entire human life, we work towards having a life that is peaceful. A life where there is no sickness, where there is no death, and when there is no worry and fear. That is why medical advancement is there. Constantly to see if we can be cured. Aging can be reduced. Everything can be done on the one side. On the other side, we have the other thing like war and other things where we ourselves as human beings, global warming, the number of flights that fly, all that uh, spoils the earth, the green, the, no, everything it goes off. So they call that, right? So all this, on the one side as human beings, we work towards a world that we want, a world that is full of peace, joy, worry free, where we, we, there is no sickness, no death, no pain, no crying. And on the other hand, we also are working on a, a world which has war, which has famine, which has uh, inequalities, poverty, everything. So as human beings, on the one side, we were created in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and therefore we have in our mind, due to our gene that has come from Adam and Eve, that this is the world that we should live in. A world of peace, a world of joy, where there is no sickness, no death, no sin, no worry, no fear and, and such things. On the other hand, we have the gene of Adam and Eve, the same Adam and Eve after they have fallen. So we are fallen generation. So constantly we are working to make this world better. Transport and everything, particularly health. We are finding so much of money is being pumped into research so that there is no sickness. So that people can live longer, there is no death. On the one hand we do this, on the other hand, we, for example, tobacco, smoking. People can kill themselves. Drugs, narcotics, people kill themselves. And murders, and crimes, and jealousy, liquor, food, cholesterol, fat, obese. One side we want to have a world that is well and good and family. On the other side we have a world that takes the life out of us. Between these two worlds, Genesis 1 and 2, the ideal world that God created. Genesis 3, the fallen world. And then in Genesis 21, 22, the world restored. Back to no fear, no crying, no pain, no death. That is Revelation chapter 21. So what happens is, in between, how do we make that change today? Revelation, it will change. But in Jesus Christ, in the middle of this uh, life, in history, he enters and he inaugurates this kingdom, kingdom of God. He says, when I come, there will be no crying, there will be no pain. The second time I come, there will be no crying, no pain, no death, and there will be no sickness. But you don't have to wait for that. Now I have come the first time, we can start with it. And that is why we are looking at this Sermon on the Mount. We are looking at this seven weeks, we are looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We have finished up to uh, six, uh, five. Today we will be doing six. And then tomorrow or the next week with seven we will finish it, right? So let me read for you just the Beatitudes again. So that we just recap what we were uh, looking at earlier. Uh, Matthew chapter five, beginning at verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We said that those who are spiritually, feel spiritually weak, they are blessed. Those who feel, I am not spiritually strong. I, I still need to come up to God's standards. God has a standard, I am falling to that standard. I still need to read the Bible more. I still need to pray more. I still need to give more. I still need to love more. I still need to sacrifice more. I still need to become holy more. I still need to speak more truth. So when people feel that blessed are the poor in spirit for this is the kingdom of heaven. To such people who feel I am inadequate in my spiritual life, God opens the gates of kingdom. So that is the first one we saw. The next one is blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Mourning includes spiritual mourning, those who mourn. I am a Christian, I am a preacher, but still I live a life that is so weak. I am not come up to that standard. I mourn over my own state of life. And the Lord says, you don't worry, I will lift you up. The Lord comforts us. I am there. All that you do is walk with me. I will take care. 
So mourning is very, very helpful, especially spiritual mourning is very helpful. When we tell the Lord that the point is poor in spirit, we feel weak, I am not able to live the Christian life I am called to. Then the doors are open and then we tell, we mourn. When will I come up out, out, out of all this sin, out of all these addictions, of, out of all these worldly pursuits that I have in my life? And then what happens is the Lord says, you don't worry, there will be comfort. And then there will be also mourning due to uh, uh, loss, loss of uh, somebody might have died, loss of job, loss of health, whatever. And the Lord says, don't worry, even in physical things and emotional things, I am there, financial loss, whatever, they will be comforted. And then you have blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, meaning those who consider others. You are not living for yourself. As Christians, we are clearly called again and again and again to live for ourselves and to live for others. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is commandment number one in New Testament. The second commandment is love your neighbor. Constantly we must see that the neighbor, that the neighborhood is better, the community is better, the church is better. That is why in church we increase so much of giving. The offering we take is not for us. The church, right? The offering we pay in the church to give, only a little amount of money goes to the church. Much of the money, 50% of that goes out to evangelism and helping the poor, building schools, colleges, orphanages, old age homes. That is because we are called to consider us others. Blessed are the meek. No, I am there, let them others have their way also. So giving important, not walking over others, but wanting to grow over others. So that will be very, very unique to us as Christians. That the offer tree we collect, sometimes we collect specially offer tree. We want to open up somewhere in orphanage, we want to have a mission Sunday and all those things. We collect. We are called. Blessed are the name. Giving way to others, not pushing, not walking over others. Spiritually, I am weak. Jesus Christ, help me. Spiritually, I have to come up. Lord, help me. And then finally here we say in this third point, Lord, let others also walk. We have confidence that God will take care. Blessed are the meek. We don't have to be competitive in this world. If two, if there is a race that we are all running, I mean, if life is a race, we don't have to compete with each other to run the race. Because the race that I have to run, the God has sent me a separate path, a separate track. And all that God expects me is, Sham, you run in that track. You don't bother about others' track, those who are running faster or slower, whether they are becoming richer or poorer. You just run your track. Blessed are the meek, right? Leaving others the way, I will do it that way. And then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. As Christians, holiness, righteousness, doing the right thing. Righteousness means doing the right thing. Constantly Christianity is a moral religion. I told you, moral, ethical, legal. Christians, we should always be legally correct. We should always be morally correct. We should always be ethically correct. Righteousness, right? Then if we want to live right, then God helps us, they shall be satisfied. He says, okay, you want to live right? I will help you to live right. It will save a lot of problems. When you open the newspaper and all, you see so many people, this one arrested for that, that one arrested for that, the big people, small people, everybody arrested. But because we believe in a God who asks us to live right, we don't have to fear that. God has taught us. So in Christian homes, we teach people discipline, truth, live right. Don't tell a lie, don't steal, don't do that. So that is inculcated in us. So it saves us. Otherwise you find big businessmen, politicians, everyone, they live well and then they get caught and then go to jail. But as we are caught here, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they shall be satisfied. And then blessed are the merciful for they shall seek mercy. It is difficult for us, but we are called to be merciful. Merciful is two things. One is to be charitable, to help others. To see if somebody is weak, we help them. Somebody can't walk, we help them to walk. Somebody needs help. In India it's very, very less. But I've seen in Western countries, Christians have a very, uh, very extending harm of help to others. If the child is a child is mentally retarded, there are other Christians in the church who come and take care of them once a week. If there is somebody who is elderly, they cook food and give. So there is a practical help in the Western countries among Christian communities. But here we have not come. Mercy. The other mercy is to forgive. If somebody has made a mistake, just overlook that. Don't always think you have done, I created a loss and a throw brick thing, no anger, vengeance and other things. Forgive. Lord, you have forgiven me, forgive others as I have been forgiven. And now today we have come to, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed. 
no joy. Christian life is supposed to be a life of joy. Joy means everything, peace, quietness, if the heart that is full, <coughs> contented. When you have joy, there is nothing else you need in your heart, right? That is the blessedness. Asi Vadamata Nerev. The whole thing of his Magich, Ullu Pula or Sandosh. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's look at it, this words, no? What do you understand by pure in God? Pure in God. Blessed are the pure in God. What? And they shall see God. The phrase pure in heart, what does it mean? Perfect. Perfect. Right? Heart should be perfect. Right? So when we are talking of holiness or goodness, perfect. No? The blessed are those whose heart is perfect. Empty any other. This one. I said no, no wrong answers. You, you can, uh, don't worry about right or wrong answers. And don't worry, only my, my face is on the camera. So your face is not there. Cleansing. Sorry, cleansing. It's a process of cleansing, right? As human beings, we are constantly people who will dirty ourselves, right? It is there. When we live in the world, however try, try to, we may try to live right, we are prone to becoming dirty. So cleansing is a process of purifying. Yes, purifying. Perfect. Psalm 24 uh, gives an explanation. Yes. Mm. Who does not trust in an idol ah. or swear by a false god. Oh, and that, is, that person is a pure in heart. That's what it says. Psalm 24 verse will be? Verse 4. Verse 4. Psalm 24 verse 4. He who has clean hands, right? And a pure heart, right? He who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear to He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The Bible calls us to a pure heart. What other understanding we have? Let's know the pure in heart. Purity of mind. Purity of mind. Purity of mind. Purity of thoughts. No, what thoughts go into us? A purity of thinking, right? Uh, a purity of thinking. Jesus Christ said, the Old Testament they said, if you look, if you commit, uh, it, uh, it's a sin. You shall not commit adultery. Ten commandments. So you shall not commit adultery. It is wrong to have an sexual relationship with any person outside your marriage. That is Bible. You shall not commit it. But Jesus Christ said, but I am telling you that you should not even look at someone with lust. Then you have committed adultery in your heart. Purity in thought. Because one day our thought will turn into action. Once we have not cut the thought, then the thought becomes work and the thought becomes action. So what Jesus Christ says is, it is true that the scriptures say, do not commit adultery. But if you want to stop committing adultery someday, today you have to purify your thought, your mind. Cleanse your mind so that your flesh will be purified. Okay? Yes, that's wonderful. Mind. Purity in uh, mind. Blessed are the pure in heart. Anything else? Purity of desire. Purity of desire. No, the purity of desire. What do we desire? Do we desire the right things, right? So when we make an evaluation, when we see something of the worldly things of uh, uh, money and all those things, no, what do we uh, desire in this world? As we live as Christians, where is our heart placed? Purity in heart, purity in desire. What do we want in this life? At the end of this life, what is it that I want to have accomplished when I choose courses, when I choose my job, when I choose my husband or wife? Whatever we choose, when we make choices, Purity of desire. Wonderful. Purity of desire. What do we choose? Mind desire. Where? Innocent. Innocence. Right? Purity in heart. Without cunningness, without shrewdness, without uh, criminal intent, without malignancy, malignance, malignance, everything. Right? Innocence. Living an innocent life. Very, very simply put. Right? Innocent life. A life, a heart where there is no place for impurity. Right? Children have innocence. They don't know what is right or wrong. They don't understand. Innocence. A heart where which still has not learned no uh, wrong things. Living in innocence. Anything else? Righteousness. Righteousness. Living right. Pure in heart means living right. Right? Living right. Like righteousness. Right? Learning to live right. Constantly checking in our heart. Are we living right? And keeping the heart in right. Right. One is by purifying. Anything else? We must be steady in what we do. We must be steady in what we do. Then only it will be pure. 
otherwise it becomes impure. So there is a constant <coughs> pure. So there is a steadiness in our life, in our mind, in our heart, in our thinking. We have to maintain a steadiness, a standard by which you know, we maintain the purity of heart. Yes, then. Anything else? Blessed are the pure in heart. Who thinks good about others? Sorry? Who thinks good about others? Good things and good about others. The thinking about relationships, right? Heart extends to relationships. The heart sometimes, what, what first you said about mind, because when we refer to heart, we refer to the mind, everything, the person. We refer to the whole person. So, the purity of mind and then the purity of relationships, right? The pure emotion, we say, you know, the emotions. So, when we get angry, when we relate to people, good things and good people, good relationships, maintaining good relationships, purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure. What, hap what happens when we are impure? Okay, let's go. go. Sorry? You lose the blessings of God. You lose the blessings of God. Right? When you become impure, you lose the blessings of God. Why do we lose the blessings of God? When we become impure. Because we are not uh, faithful. We are not faithful. That's true. Not holy. Sorry? Not holy. Not holy. Yes. So we lose that. Staying away, right? Because when we when we uh, we lose blessings because we are staying away. Okay, let's keep that in mind and now look at the verse. Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. So why do we need purity? To see God, right? I, I, I think the entire Bible can be summarized into this one verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, right? I think there can be nothing higher than seeing God. Is there anything higher than seeing God? That's why it was going away. Means, we see, only if I am here, you can see. If I leave to that room, you cannot see me. If we move away, if people are in strain and they move away, you cannot see each other. Or if people move away farther for whatever reasons, you cannot see. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, right? So when we sing, we lose blessings because we move away from God. That is the biggest uh, risk, right? When we sing, we lose. The greatest, the power, right? The Christian life is secret, in this impurity. The power of Christian life, right? The power, the victorious Christian life. Uh, I read a book very young when I was about... 25 or something, watchman, me, a Chinese uh, person wrote the victorious Christian life. In that book, uh, it speaks about victory and other things. Power, right? The Christian's secret is power, and power comes from purity. And our God, His power, the Lord, no, His power, the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, God the Father, as we speak, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Holy Spirit, the power of God comes from His holiness. He is so pure, power comes to him. The power comes out of his holiness. That is how it comes, right? So, for they shall see God. This is the highest, I think, in my opinion, a Christian can attain to see God. There can be no greater state we can look. What do you mean by seeing God? What do you mean by seeing God? Sorry? Communion with Him. Right? Communion with Him. Relating with Him. Right? Because God lives within us. So what happens is, when, when we say to see God, it means we are relating to God within ourselves. Am I getting it right from you? Communion with God. Communion with God. Sorry, you said communion with God. Okay. Relating to God. Speaking to God. So when we say that uh, you shall see God, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Those who purify their heart, have the privilege and honor of talking to God, of communicating to God. Yes, what else? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you see God, you shall see God means it's the Holy Spirit, right? You have a verse reference for that or you just want to see? 
No, actually, the Psalm 51, yeah. 10 onwards, yes. speaks. Yeah. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Yeah. Create in me a pure heart of Create in me. So, there is sin in this life, David and Bathsheba. He moves away from God. He realizes that we said, no, our holiness, we move away from God and we lose the blessing. So, the moment David did that in Bathsheba's case, what happens is, he immediately realizes, Nathan comes and tells you, David, you have done wrong. And David doesn't contest that. As a king, he would have chopped off the head of the prophet. But he says, I have sinned. That is the word he says. I have, the, the translation, exact translation of Hebrew will be, I have failed. So he, moved, he immediately realizes, I have made a terrible mistake in my life. And he says to God, have mercy on my God. And then he says, do not cast me away from your presence. Don't throw me away. As you said, no, the present, we are moving away from God. Lord, please do not move away from me. Lord, don't move away from me. Do not cast me away from your presence. But create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Give me a steadfast spirit. Let me read you a, a small passage, no? We all know that God exists. And yet, we do not see Him. We all know that God exists. And yet we do not see him. We do not understand him. Hmm? Sorry? I, I'm reading from a book, small book, right? We all know that God exists and yet we do not see him. We do not understand him. Take one of these great messengers of light and compare his character with the highest ideal of God and that you ever formed and you will find that your God falls short of the ideal and that the character of the prophet, that is Jesus, exceeds your conceptions. You cannot even imagine a higher ideal of God than what actually have practically realized and set before us an example. We all know that God exists and yet we do not see Him. We do not understand Him. This is the words of Swami Vivekananda. Right? He has written in a book called Christ the Messenger. Right? In this book he says the quest that we all know. As human beings, we all have that quest to see God. That is why he makes it. We all know that God exists. Of course, there are atheists who don't believe that God exists. And yet, we do not see him. So on the one side, you have atheists who don't believe in God at all. So that is one. On the other hand, you have people who believe in God, but people who have not seen him. We, we all know that God exists, and yet we do not see him. We do not understand him. So there is always this human quest because we have lived as the, as the gene of Adam and Eve somewhere in us, in our gene, in our soul, in our spirit, in our mind, in our brain, in our body, we have that experience of Adam and Eve passed on to us that we were with God and we know God and therefore God, we were in communication with God and we were talking to God and therefore that quest is there to see God. And as we read the, in Genesis chapter 3, that time in the evening, when Adam and Eve, after they have eaten, in the cool of the evening, that is in the evening, God came and talked to them. So they were in communication, then God asks, well, Adam, where are you? Because Adam is missing in the park. He was used to be sick and they used to come, he is not there. So the Lord asks him, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I am hiding. You are hiding? Why did you hide? Where are you hiding? Because I sinned. And then he says, what did you do? Did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? Eve gave. So, and then he asked, Eve, what did you do? And then Eve says, the serpent deceived me. Here is a God and a human being talking continuously. When they saw God. Because until that stage they were pure. Till that stage they were pure. But the moment they fell, they hid from God. They moved away from God. God, it is not that God has moved away from us. Do not cast me away from thy presence. God doesn't cast us from his presence. We move away from God's presence. Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit and they could have just stayed there. God could have not come that evening. He, he would have known. He, he definitely God knows. God could have said, Adam and Eve, you ate the fruit I told you not to eat. I'm not going to come and I'm not going to come. No. In his appointed time, in the evening, he came and he asked. But it was Adam and Eve who moved away from God. And they went and hid. 
and they also realized that they were naked so far they didn't uh, were not aware as they were naked young children they are born no till they grow up they know they are naked they just come it is the parents who give them the bath its parents who dress them up they don't know they are naked but at some stage when become older they know they are uh, naked and we also tell them to dress so they go and dress privately after that but till that stage it's the parents who give them bath it is the parents who give them the dress everything they don't know after some time they are very conscious and we are also conscious they have grown up so they were coming every day and god was talking to them when they were not they didn't have uh, the the sense that i am naked but here when he came when they sinned they immediately realized that we are naked and so they made clothes for themselves they have grown adults before that so they hid so they moved away from god and that gene is there somewhere seeking god to seek out so they were seeing and talking to god and then they lost it and god doesn't move away that's one thing we must always know when we feel that god's presence is not with us we shouldn't be wondering why did god move away from me why is god so far where is god those are not the questions that we must be asking they are all the wrong questions the right questions we must be asking is where i moved away from god how did i move away from god why did i move away from god where am i right so whenever we feel that god is not there or god has let me down god has not the question we need to ask is i have moved away from god and ask god lord i have moved away from you help me to come back to you create in me a clean heart o oh god and do not cast me away from your presence from your presence no he does it. the lord never give god is a faithful god that is why though the bible begins with adam and eve the bible runs to the whole history world history of uh, uh, mesopotamian civilization and then to egypt where abraham was and then to egyptian civilization where moses was and then it moves to jordan and israel where uh, the civilization was then assyria and then to babylon again with the tigris and euphrates river and then it moves to the babylonian empire assyrian empire first world empire then babylonian empire then persian empire then egyptian empire everything the bible moves till jesus christ time when it comes to roman empire the final roman world so the bible didn't stop with adam and eve it keeps running because in the bible we have a god who is speaking a god who is communicating and this is not a book of lecture god did not say okay adam sit and write or moses you sit and write no this is a book where constantly human beings spoke with god and god spoke with them that is why we are saying about david that is why we are saying about adam and eve so the bible is a book of record where constantly god is speaking to human beings and human beings are talking to god the only thing is what happens is at times they come very close to god wonderful relationships like david and the lord had abraham moses and then ezra nehemiah daniel wonderful relationships then what you have david himself falls and then what happens the kings the israel splits into two kingdoms and israel kings are all the worst none of them believe in the lord in judah empire some believe and some didn't believe so this book is full of interaction of god constantly pursuing us a god who is faithful a god who doesn't give us up because we have sinned it's like a parent no but the child has failed let us say in exams or let us say in conduct in character whatever the parent doesn't give up that father or the mother doesn't give up doesn't matter you have failed you study we are there we'll help you we'll do that so this whole book is a book of constantly where god pursues us a constant pressure of god coming close to us but we moving away from us sometimes we close go close to god sometimes we move away from god so the when we read the bible what we see is it is not a religious discourse it is not a, a, a book no where philosophy is written it is not a theological book it is a simple book of human and divine relationship 
and the secret of how do we maintain that relationship how did abraham and god relate how did moses and god relate how did samuel and god relate how did joshua and god relate how did david and god relate how did the prophets relate isaiah relate how did jeremiah relate how did the apostles relate how did paul relate how did everyone relate the whole book the bible is a book of relationship between the lord and between his people constantly calling the people of the world to come to him in relationship a god who speaks so blessed are those who are pure in heart for they shall for they shall see god is one way is that a community communicating god a god who communicates other ways of seeing god what is to communicate we god communicate anything else when we say this are the pure for they shall see god how do we see god god communicates with us anything else has anyone in the bible seen god okay moses moses right moses in the tent right the lord says i i spoke to you face to face right as a friend it's a voice but he also spoke to them face to face right the lord says i spoke but nobody can see god in a sense because if we see god in his glory we will just be consumed now that pastor mari was in every pair but he went away for a second for you so even when moses says i want to see you lord what is your name god says i will go by the mountain i will take you and i will put it in the mountain top in a corner i will pass by you and then i will put my hand i will cover and then i will pronounce my name and so what god does is he lifts moses and he puts it at a corner in the mountain and then the lord passes his glory his power passes through and then the lord puts his hand and then he says i am who i am and he covers because if moses sees god then he will be burnt none of us can survive right so he but to the extent he can see the presence and to a little extent god reveals himself who else has seen god Uh, yes, yes. That that they were in the below. Those who saw and talked to the Lord was only Moses. Only Moses talked to the Lord in the tent, face to face. And those who were there, up yeah, twenty people who were there in the you mean the experience of uh, the 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 ten commandments that he took the elders above. Yeah, they yes, and then who? the disciples whose disciples jesus jesus disciples right jesus disciples right see no one can see god no one can see god without holiness uh, no one can see god is one verse that hebrew says and also the bible says that the, the, if anybody sees god he will be burnt right the glory of the god the fire of the god is so much his light is so bright so no one can see god so how do we then see god so the only way for human beings to see god is god for human god in human how that that's all right if if uh, you cannot become uh, if you can't see god god is there then the only way that human beings can see is for god to become a human being He, he has to restrict himself. And so, for for example, we are playing with a child. You know, uh, let's say you play with a child some uh, chess or something. You cannot play equal. So, when you play, you move the coins in such a way you make mistake, you lose the game. You have to come down to that child's level of uh, uh, age five or age twelve, and then play the chess or cricket, whatever. So that the child also wins. You come down to that level and play equal. So we cannot see God. It is impossible to see God. because god is too big it is uh, his glory is too powerful his holiness is too uh, pure 100% right uh, purity and therefore it is not possible to see god but nevertheless god has this deep quest to relate to us and therefore he became a human being therefore we can see god hmm? in 1 john chapter 1 verse 1 1 john right 
1 John, the disciples, we said, no, it's a wonderful one here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Can you read it, please? That which was from the beginning. Mm. That which was from the beginning. Okay, yeah. Which we have heard. Which we have heard. Which we have seen. What was there from the beginning? The word. The word, the word meaning? God. God meaning? Jesus. Jesus. That is John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he lived among us. And the word became flesh. John 1 14. So that which was from the beginning that is Jesus who was from the beginning and then which we have heard. Whom did they hear? John is saying here. We heard Jesus. And that is why in Matthew chapter 5 when we are looking at the Beatitude it says and he opened his mouth and taught them saying God is directly talking to us through his mouth opening and here which we have heard and then we have seen, seen our eyes what, a, what an excitement John has in writing that we have heard God we have heard the word and we have seen him we have seen the very incarnation of God God has to bring down himself to such a small level as a human being so that when we see him as a human being or when we, even in the book Moses, he said, keep the people away from the mountain. If they hear my voice, they will die. So even to hear God's voice, people will die. To see God, people will die. Don't come near the mountain because if you come near the mountain, you will die. Die, die, die. So the only way for God to talk to us, because sin was, earlier he was talking to Adam and Eve without difficulty. He, they saw him, they talked to him. But now the sin came, we couldn't talk. So, don't come near the mountain, you will die. Don't hear me, you will die. Don't see me, you will die. But here it says, he had to come down to that level we can relate, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon. And then, we have seen, and which we? Have looked at. Uh, and we looked at, we saw God. We saw Jesus. We saw God. And? And our hands have touched. Ah, that is the excitement he says. You know, we touched Jesus. We touched God. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a great honor and privilege that we have. A God beyond infinite God. A God of power. A God of wisdom. A God of glory. A God of love and truth. A God of uh, holiness, purity, everything beyond imagination. But this God comes in such a way, the Word became flesh. The Word became human. And this is the human we saw. And this is the human we talked to. And this is the human because they were apostles. They were going in the boat, they were fishing and everything. We touched him. We touched him. Right? So that is possible. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Any other verse on uh, uh, what, anyone seeing God or hearing God? In the, <coughs> in the Bible. Any other? Isaiah. Isaiah. What does Isaiah say? Isaiah chapter 6, he says, In the year, in the year that King Uzziah died, in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Whole earth is full of glory. Isaiah saw heaven. And not only he saw heaven, he saw the Lord. That's a very, very exceptional vision somebody has had in the Bible. Moses had an exceptional uh, experience of talking to God face to face. Not like a, a vision, not an audio, not an oracle, not a prophet, that a voice that came from inside. The Lord said, I speak to you as a human talks to you, face to face. This is like Isaiah. Now let's say that heaven is that side of the screen. It is like Isaiah pulling that screen and then peeping into the screen to see the heaven behind the screen. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Something we can't see. 
Christianity makes it possible for us to see God. Isaiah saw the Lord. Moses talked to him face to face. The disciples touched him. And the disciples who touched him, Adam and Eve spoke. And we are seeing again and again. So, Jesus Christ promises, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a great joy for us and what a great honor for us that we can see God. What it requires? Purity. Constantly asking us, Lord, purify us. We want to see too. It is not the privilege of some people. Jesus Christ did not say, Blessed are the rich people, for they shall see God. He did not say, well, Blessed are the Bible scholars, Bible teachers, Bible preachers, PhDs, and others. They will see God. He simply said, Blessed are the pure in heart. Whether you are rich or poor, whether you are educated or uneducated, make yourself pure and you shall see God. Meaning, you can hear God, you can see God, you can sense God. God's presence is with me and you will hear God. Only thing is, we have to ask the Lord, Lord, speak to us. But in the same Isaiah chapter 6, you know, uh, the Lord will say, uh, in verse 9, keep on hearing but do not understand, keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull and their ears heavy and blind their ears, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. The Lord is also saying, preach in such a way, preach till these people can't see and can't hear because they are not obeying. So purification is obedience. So, greatest promise we have here, the Bible or anyone can offer is to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. And the calling that we have is to simply to purify ourselves. As we purify ourselves, we can see God. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. What a great God you are. You have revealed to us yourself the unknowable, the one beyond understanding. The one whom no one can see and survive. The one who is fire. The one who is glory. The one who is bright light. The one who is truth. The one who is love, wisdom and power. No one can come to you. But you have come to us. In your son Jesus Christ you have come to us. So that we can touch you. We can talk to you. We can relate to you. We can sense your presence. We can see you. And Lord I pray this evening you will purify so that we can see you. Wash us with the blood of your Son, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and grant us this grace, Lord, for grant us grace by pulling this screen uh, so that we can talk to you. Whatever is there, Lord, let me remove. The cloud and the dust and the impurity that we have, wash it, Lord, cleanse it, Lord, and I pray that we will be able to see you, hear you, and Lord, we will be able to, Lord, live with you, relate with you, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I am asking this prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Amen.